Hi, my name is Deborah. This is Booking with Deborah. Today's video is another wrap up video of some of the books that I have read in July and August. All being well, a little bit before this video, I will have posted a video which is a wrap up of all my recent books that I have read for my Read Around the World challenge. I will include that video in the description box down below if you want to go and check that out if you've not seen seen it already. The first of the books that I want you to wrap up was a classic that I buddy read with art at a book a shelf odyssey whose channel I will link in the description box down below and together we read Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. I just want to say a massive thank you to Art for buddy reading this book with me. I think we both really enjoyed reading this book. We did it as quite a slow read over the course of the month. Previously I have only read some short stories by Elizabeth Gaskell so this is the first sort of novel I suppose that I've read by Elizabeth Gaskell. However, when this book was first published, it was published in serial format in, I believe, uh, what was Charles Dickens magazine at the time. This book is all about early Victorian life in a countryside rural town and we mainly follow the lives of two spinster sisters, as they would be described at that time, Miss Matty and Miss Deborah, but we also meet a whole host of other really interesting and engaging characters. And although this book looks on the surface like um, short snippets of life in this rural community. In reality it actually has a lot to say about the lives of women in that Victorian era in a rural town setting in the north of England. The town that is the focus of this novel is a town made up mainly of women, most of whom are sort of single so they've never been married or they're widowed. Our main character is Mrs Smith who is a bit younger than um, Miss Matty and Miss Deborah and a bit younger than some of the other characters that we meet. She is sharing with us some of the day-to-day -day happenings in the town. There's a lot of um, information in here about how polite society to lived at that time and um, social customs and social expectations. The community of women that we get to know feel that money and wealth is vulgar and it is not something that they are willing to discuss or acknowledge and that in itself can lead to some quite funny and entertaining comedic parts in this book and this book really does have a wonderful blend of those snippets of comedy where you literally find yourself laughing out loud with uh, contrasted with some real life more serious things that happen to the women in this community that have themes around loss, grief, um, financial concerns, ill health. And Gaskell does an amazing job of showing how the women live or try to live their best life while managing the limitations that being a woman in their position places upon them at that time. And I found myself getting really attached to some of the wonderful characters in this book, particularly Miss Matty, who's a very endearing lady. In this book, Gaskell highlights some of the very important issues affecting women at the time. Issues around relationships, marriage, whether, whether the women have had children or not had children, security and financial independence, social and cultural norms, and expectations and cultural etiquette. But what this book also is, is a celebration of women's lives at the time and a celebration of the importance of friendship and the power that friendship can have and the positive influence it can have on our lives. And that aspect of this book I really did enjoy. I think it really did help me to connect with these women um, and recognise some that you know, they're not as different from us as we might think they are. I really did enjoy reading this book. It's really piqued my interest in Gaskell as an author, but also as a woman who lived in the Victorian era. She bases a lot of her work in the north of England, which is obviously where I live. So I am really interested to read more of Gaskell's work. In particular, I have North and South on my list of 50 books to read before I'm 50, so I am hoping to read that at some point. The next couple of books that I wanted to talk about were the books that I read for Jane Austen July. And the first one of those was Persuasion, which I read as part of the Persuasion Along, a read-along that was hosted by Jack at Spread Book Joy and Gemma of Gem of Books. So thank you very much to both of those for hosting this read-along. Persuasion was my first book 
of Jane Austen's. It was the last of her novels to be published and it was actually published after her death. Our main character is Anne Elliot, who is seen as past her prime in her mid-twenties, having called off an earlier engagement to Frederick Wentworth. She was persuaded by her family that he was not a suitable match. However, as the book evolves, Mr Wentworth returns to the area and back into Anne's life. I really like the character of Anne Elliot. She is very different from the rest of her family, who are all very obsessed with social standing and appearances. And they're all really quite unlikable, but that makes them all quite entertaining for the reader. What I would say about my reading experience of this book is it really did give me an appreciation of Jane Austen's skill as a writer. and. It really generated an interest for me in the Georgian and Regency era, which was not a part of history that I'm really that familiar with. I tend to be drawn more to the Victorian era. This novel does explore everyday life in that era, including things like social expectations, cultural norms, socialising, shopping and attitudes towards marriage. I really feel this book highlights some of the important issues affecting women at the time, in particular the importance of marriage for financial security and to give women position and standing. For women at that time, in this class, marriage was an arrangement. It was not necessarily anything to do with love or romance. What I feel this book really does do is highlight the possibility of marriage for love and romance. And I think it's quite difficult for us as contemporary readers, as modern day readers, to really understand just how groundbreaking that is as an idea. I also really appreciated Jane Austen's condemning of the estate laws at the time. Because Jane Austen highlights the idea of marriage being for love and romance, I feel that she is condemning the estate laws at the time which trapped women and prevented them from having any independence or control over their own lives. And although as a modern day reader I am not particularly interested in romance and I'm usually not that interested in reading about the experience of the privileged or middle upper classes. I have to say I am a big fan of love and the importance of people being able to marry for love and I think having got a better understanding of the Regency era that people needed a bit of love and romance in their lives at that time and I think that is part of the role that Austen's books played. So as I said this was my first reading of a Jane Austen book however I am not sure that Jane Austen is going to be one of my favourite classic authors. The next book that I read for Jane Austen July was to meet the prompt of read a non-fiction work about Jane Austen or her time and for that I chose to read A Visitor's A Guide to Jane Austen's England by Sue Wilkes. This book is an exploration of the middle and upper classes and their lives in 1775 from the year of Jane Austen's birth right up to her death in 1817 and covers all aspects of daily life in the Regency era. This is quite a short book and I did find some in, some aspects of this book more interesting than others. It, does, it really does put Jane Austen's writing into uh, the historical context of the time and it helped me to fill in some of my knowledge gaps around the Regency era. It has a number of different chapters exploring themes around travelling, money and finances, shopping and leisure, marriage and finding a partner and in sickness and in health. What I would say about this book for anyone who is interested to find out more about the Regency era, this book does contain spoilers for some of Jane Austen's books. That didn't particularly bother me or prevent me from wanting to read this book but it is something that people should be aware of. Another prompt for Jane Austen July was to read historical fiction set in Jane Austen's time and for that I read Burning Bright by Tracy Chevalier. This is historical fiction set in 1792 and I listened to this on audiobook. Burning Bright follows the Kellaway family as they move from rural Dorset to London. They end up living next to the radical painter and poet William Blake and working for a nearby circus. Two of the main characters are children, Jem Calloway, who befriends Maggie, a local girl, and the book explores their friendship and the family's experiences of living life in London. What I enjoyed about this book was the, the way it explored working class life in London and to a lesser extent working life class in rural Dorset during that era. And it really did give me a really nice contrast between middle class sort of um, 
between the middle class portrayal of life that is covered in persuasion. As with a lot of Tracy Gervellier's books, this book really did capture a lot of atmosphere and I always feel that Tracy Chevalier does a lot of research into her historical fiction. There was a real atmosphere of London at the time and it's set against the backdrop of the revolution in France. It shows the reality of working within a circus during the era and what life was like for working class communities in London. This book was just a nice easy listen to me. I did really appreciate the contrast with persuasion and it did pique my interest around working class life during the Regency era. The next three books that I want to wrap up are three bedtime listens. For anyone who is not aware, I tend to listen to audiobooks to help me fall asleep at night, so they are generally books that don't tackle anything too challenging or too triggering or difficult because I don't want it to interfere with me having a good night's sleep. The first of those books I wanted to talk about was A Terrible Kindness by Joe Browning Role. Starting out in October 1966 where we meet William Lavery who has recently completed his training as an embalmer. Then the devastating landslide at a coal mine in Ebervan in Wales occurs. William volunteers to attend but it will be his first in job as an embalmer and it will be one he will never forget. The timeline of this book circles around as we get to know William as a child. The timeline of this book is that it starts out in 1966 with the tragedy that happened in Aberfan in Wales and I feel that this part of the book was handled quite sensitively. Um, for anyone who is not aware what occurred in Aberfan in Wales in 1966 is that there was a, a landslide when a lot of coal waste which we would call slag um, came crashing down into the local community uh, burying a number of houses but also the local school which had children in at the time and that resulted in the death of 116 children and 28 adults. I appreciated how this book highlighted that event and in particular how it acknowledged the role that volunteers can have in these sorts of tragic um, disasters that happen. And at the start of the book the author does dedicate the book to the embalmers who volunteered and responded to do very very difficult work as part of the response to the Aberfan disaster. And that is not something that I had ever really considered before or read about before. The story also explores the long-term impact and the PTSD or what we now know to be PTSD that can stem from disasters and highlights and highlights how this can affect volunteers who step up in times of need. However, the blurb of this book, for me, implied that that was the focus of the book. But in reality, the Aberfan um, aspect of the book is mainly co covered at the beginning and the end of the book, and I couldn't help but feel a little bit like the author hooked onto that tragedy as a means for the rest of the book. A lot of the book actually explores William's life as a child. William is a talented chorist who is trained in one of the best schools in Cambridge. We explore his very difficult and complex relationship with his mother and we also get to know his uncle Robert and his partner Howard and the key role that they played in his childhood. And although this book did have a lot to say about relationships and trauma and how things that happened to us in the past can impact our life in the present and impact us moving forward and I do feel like the Aberfan sections were handled quite sensitively. I do feel like the blurb on this book maybe was a little bit misleading. The next bedtime audiobook was Away with the Penguins by Hazel Pryor. Veronica McCready is 85 years old and lives in a mansion by the sea in Ayrshire, Scotland. Veronica rarely sees anyone else choosing to spend her days mostly at home alone watching wildlife documentaries but after revisiting events from her long buried past Veronica McCready is inspired to go on a journey of a lifetime. This was a really lovely bedtime listen for me and I chose to listen to this book after seeing it reviewed on Nikki's channel Red Dot Reads and also on Emily's channel at Novel Novels. They both talked about how much they'd enjoyed this book so I will link their channel in the description box down below and I just wanted to say thank you for inspiring me to pick up this book. This book felt a little bit similar to the writing of Frederick Backman in his novels and also a little bit like The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry which is a book I read many years ago but I do remember 
enjoying. Veronica McCready is the main character in this story. She is quite a grumpy, lonely older protagonist who is very opinionated and determined. The more you get to know Veronica, the more she grows on you and the more I found myself really liking her as a character. I'm not going to say too much about the plot of this book because I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I would describe this book as a very heartful, heartfelt, heartwarming, life-affirming read. And I re you really do find yourself rooting for Veronica as she goes on this amazing once-in-a-lifetime journey. And by the end of this book, you will have a newfound appreciation of penguins. And then the final book that I wanted to wrap up is The Key in the Lock by Beth Underdown. This is historical fiction based in Cornwall in 1918. The main protagonist is Ivy who is mourning the loss of her son Tim in the Great War. This story is told in dual timelines. As well as being set in 1918, we look back when Ivy worked with her father, the local doctor, and they are called to attend a fatal fire at the local great house. Ivy is sure that there is more to what happened all those years ago at the great house and the terrible events that came after, a truth she must discover if she is ever to be free. So this historical fiction book was quite a haunting gothic read. It's quite atmospheric and is a bit of a slow burn psychological drama. We meet a whole host of characters, some of whom are based at the Great House. So we meet the master of the Great House and his son, and also a number of the servants working there, in addition to Ivy and her father who is a local doctor. What we discover is that quite a lot of the characters in this novel all have secrets and they all at times feel somewhat deceitful. We follow Ivy as she revisits the past while trying to cope with changes to her life having lost her son in the present. And one of the main questions that runs throughout this novel is was there a murder at the Great House in 1888? And if so, who is responsible? People who have reviewed this book have compared it to Rebecca by Daphne de Bourier. Now, I have not read that book, so I cannot say whether it is similar to that, but for anybody who has read and enjoyed uh, Rebecca by Daphne de Maurier, you may want to check out this historical fiction book as well. I read Beth Underdown's previous novel, The Witchfinder Sister, quite a few years ago, and I have to say I did enjoy this novel more than The Witchfinder Sister. Her writing style is very good at creating atmosphere, however this was just another easy bedtime listen for me. It did retain my interest and I did find it engaging throughout listening to her book. It seems to have become quite forgettable quite quickly, and I'm not sure why that is. It may just be where I was at with the time and what was going on in my own life. Um, but I did find that when I've come to wrap up this book, I had to go back and revisit the blurb to remember anything about it. Although I enjoyed this book and I did think it was quite well written, I don't think it will be a standout historical fiction novel for me. But those are all the rest of the books that I read during July and August. I would love to hear in the comments down below if you've read any of these books. I'd also love to hear what you are currently reading and how you are finding it. If you read any good books recently that you would like to recommend, please do share those and the comments in the section box down below. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye!